O Lord, our God, our King, the sovereign over all nations, and the one who has loved us individually, personally, to go from woe is me to send me is such undeserved privilege. All of your grace, all of mercy, and at the cost of your son on the cross, paying for our sins in his own body that we might be reconciled, that we might be recipients of your kindness and your grace rather than the wrath that was due us. Lord, these manifold mercies are inducements to worship, to praise. And may the things that we have just sung with our lips be the truth of our lives. We ask that you would help us even this morning in the study of your word to that end. May we worship you truly. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And I just saw Mike and Tanya Jolly in the hallway. Did that, oh, Okay, now I'm really going to embarrass you in the back. Uh, it's been a decade in Montana since they were last here. So guys, welcome back. We're just thrilled that you're here. We're in our verse-by-verse exposition of Paul's letter to the church at Rome. And we've been a couple of years in this endeavor And we come this morning to a significant turn in the book of Romans. Romans 12.1 begins with the word, therefore. And of course, we have learned to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? And this therefore is the hinge in the book of Romans between a doctrinal exposition of the gospel and the implications of that gospel lived out in the life of a Christian. This is a significant turn. We begin today to think through, how do I live the Christian life? And in the first 11 chapters of Romans, we've seen a few commands here and there, but from verse 1 of chapter 12 onward, we see a long string of commands. And all of it, the doctrinal portion and what we might call the practical portion of Romans, all of it is of grace. All of it is the gospel, the good news The good news of God and the gospel through Jesus Christ is not simply a message of forgiveness, but of forgiveness and transformation. And we're beginning to look this morning at how that transformation gets lived out. How the grace of God looks in a rescued life. What we see in chapter 12 onward is the reign of grace in flesh and blood. Turn back to Romans chapter 5 and verse 20. We were introduced to this phrase, the reign of grace, by a contrast to the tyranny of sin. Do you remember this? Verse 21. So that just as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. To reign is to king, if you can make a verb out of the noun king. It is to dominate, it is to be the sovereign over a dominion, and all of us from birth lived under the reign of sin, the tyranny of sin, a total tyranny, and we have been transferred by God's kindness, undeserved kindness and love, out from under the tyranny of sin to the dominion of grace or the reign of grace. You see, the Christian life is not just a, I have a get out of hell free card in my wallet and go about my business. The grace that reigns through righteousness into eternal life is a total absorption under the beautiful life transforming reign of God's grace. And just as we were dominated before we knew Christ by the enslaving power of sin, an awful tyrant that only brought death and destruction under the disguise of cheap delights, now we are dominated in Christ by the love of God and the never-ending train of undeserved kindness and privilege. The day you truly met Christ was your introduction into this grace in which you now stand. 
Romans 5, 2. And what followed is a life under that grace. So what does the Christian life look like? How do I now live this Christian life? What does the reign of grace look like in flesh and blood? Romans 12, 1 and 2 introduce us to that whole idea. This is where the next section of Romans takes us. More grace, more mercy, yielded lives being transformed by the power of God. Look how the corner is turned here in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul writes, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. What is this passage all about? Simply this, the reign of grace produces a life of worship. The reign of grace produces a life of worship, and that is going to be spelled out for us in flesh and blood details from Romans 12, 1 and on. And it is carried out in two summary commands here in verses 1 and 2 of Romans 12. These summary commands are short statements that encapsulate all that will follow. These instructions in Romans 12, 1 and 2 are the summary umbrella for the instruction of the Christian life in the remainder of this letter. And would summarize them simply in two commands. Worship God in dedication, verse 1, and worship God in transformation, verse 2. We're going to be looking at the first of those this morning, Romans 12, 1. I'll read it to you again. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. This is your spiritual service of worship. What do you think when someone talks about worship today? Do we think about the music time in a church service? Maybe we think about the public gathering and the totality of a church service or, or some other religious gathering. What would people have thought of if you said the word worship in Jerusalem or in Rome in the first century? You might think of going to the temple in Jerusalem and participating in the various animal sacrifices and the various festivals and the feasts and all the other things that went on at the temple in Jerusalem. Or in Rome, you might think about the idols that sat on your table or the idols on street corners or the thought of always making an appeasement of sacrifice to a pantheon of so-called gods. And today, when someone asks you, say, when is your worship service? Romans 12.1 is going to teach us to say, all day. You mean you go to church the whole Sunday? No, 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 you misunderstand. Our worship service is all day, every day. That is the point of Romans 12, 1 and 2. That the worship that mercy produces, that the reign of grace produces, is a life lived devoted to God. A life lived dedicated to Him. That is a biblical definition of worship. And it begins with this remarkable hinge word, therefore, in 12.1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren. This word gives us the relationship between Romans 12.1 and what follows and everything that went before. He, he's not merely saying the, the therefore from the outburst of praise in chapter 11, verses 30 to 36, is you should live this way. He's not simply saying that a reflection on the mercies of God, where we saw undeserving Gentiles brought to the gospel, Jews cut off for unbelief, and then one day, believing Jews grafted back in, can you believe the mercy of God, therefore live? This, therefore, goes all the way back to chapter 1, where Paul introduces us to the gospel, which brings the very righteousness of God that sinners need to stand in God's presence and delight in the radiating awesomeness of his glory rather than be incinerated by it. 
It is the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ that is the foundation for this therefore. It is the gospel that, God is, that Paul has been articulating for us in the first 11 chapters. It is all of that monumental, massive summit of sovereign mercy we've been climbing for the last few years. And what we see here in Romans 12, 1 and following are the implications of the mercy of God and the gospel unfolded in chapters 1 to 11. And listen, God knows what we need. We've had 11 chapters primarily of instruction, of indicative statements, statements of fact. And we're moving now to a long string of imperatives or commands, directives from God. It is the ethic for God's people based upon the revelation of God's kindness. And the relationship between those two things is so important, it cannot be overstated. How do doctrine and duty go together? And they must go together. Consider for a moment duty separated from doctrine. What if you just had a bunch of rules, a bunch of instructions for life without the foundation of the mercy of God and the gospel? You might have just some advice given or, or maybe some really authoritative advice given for procedures for community living so we can all get along. You might have some instructions for personal improvement, behavior modification to make your life better or to, to be a good citizen. What a, what a tragic thing to have a, a deadness in your life related to what you do because you don't have the right basis for why you do it. To have a selfishness at the center of what you do. Because you don't have the from him and through him and to him, to him be the glory forever, amen, basis for living how you live. The result of duty without doctrine is legalism. That is, I have to follow these rules, I just got to. And that produces a judgmentalism. Look at those other guys who don't follow the rules that I'm following. How dare they? It results in an elitism and a behaviorism and pride. The moralist rejects the foundation of God's mercy in the gospel and seeks some sort of self-improvement. This is man-centered, man-generated. It is from me, through me, and to me. It is the religion of humanity. And it is frankly offensive to God. Consider, on the other hand, doctrine separated from duty. To be in the presence of the great and immense glory of the grace of God and the gospel and to be unmoved by it, untransformed by it, to have a, a dead orthodoxy. Listen, it's not enough simply to know to know facts about God, to know truths about the gospel, to be able to articulate right doctrine and not to worship with your very life. A Christian who merely rejoices in the foundation of grace but disregards the obligations of grace is not a biblical Christian. To intellectually grasp the grandeur of the grace of God but to be unmoved, unchanged, unsurrendered to continue to live your life for yourself is to be an unbeliever. You say, wait, I, I believe the gospel. You don't believe it in the biblical sense of belief, which is an acquisition of the truths of the facts of the gospel and right doctrine, but a surrender to the one whose mercy has been poured out. Duty based on doctrine is beautiful. It is the life lived under the reign of grace. And all of God's imperatives rest on the foundation of God's indicatives. T to know God rightly and to embrace God's grace through the gospel is the only foundation for living in a way that pleases Him. Listen, you cannot please God by behavioral adjustment until you have come to the glory of God in the gospel. Right duty depends on right doctrine. In fact, if you think about your own life and any sin, any ethical error, any behavioral error, 
It's really hard to conceive of a single one that does not have its roots in wrong theology. You can trace every sin back to something believed wrongly or not believed about God, about us, about sin, about salvation. Right theology is the right foundation for right living. And right living is the right response, the only appropriate response to right doctrine. These two things go together. And listen, I know we're all wired a little bit differently. Some of us really thrive on doctrinal and instructional sections. Uh, We love to have our thoughts lifted and think big, great, grand, lofty thoughts of God and have a, a right, low view of ourselves and Uh, appropriate the the realities and understand all the intricacies of God's grace. And there's something in us that doesn't like to be told what to do. And there are others of us who just give me something practical. Just tell me what to do. And God knows us. He knows we need 11 chapters of doctrine explaining the gospel in detail and its intricacies, all for the glory of God, putting us in our right place and exalting God in his right place before we even have a frame of reference to know how to do what to do. And he also knows our frame that we might not necessarily draw out the proper implications of right doctrine. And so in God's kindness, he's going to help us think that through in the remainder of this letter. By the way, there's there's an embedded sermon in there about the the importance of consecutive exposition in preaching, right? We might gravitate to our favorite passages, our favorite topics, our favorite kinds of things to think about. But if what our obligation is as a body of believers is just to put ourselves under the next verses, (laughs) there's not a lot of wiggle room there. We get what God has designed for us verse by verse. Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brethren. Paul is speaking to Christians, and he uses this word that means oftentimes to come alongside of, to encourage, to exhort. And here in view of the mercies of God, here by apostolic authority, here on the hinge of the letter to Romans, this is a full-weighted, God-authorized command for us to live a certain way. In many contexts, this word is used as a command in view of God's work of salvation. It is so here in this text. God's salvation has been in view for 11 chapters, and so Paul urges us Christians. And he says, by the mercies of God, that is, in view of God's mercy, in view of everything that we've just talked about, by by the full weight of by the, by the fuel and the propellant that is the mercy of God in, in manifold scenes, I urge you. The Russian space program has used its basic Soyuz R-7 rocket since 1966 to take all kinds of things up into space. They've performed 1,700 flights. The Soyuz rockets carried Sputnik, the first satellite, Laika, the first dog, nuclear warheads, military satellites, cosmonauts, and since the the end of the U.S. shuttle program has been the only vehicle able to make the trip to the International Space Station. It is a football field high rocket in two stages. It weighs 280 tons. 253 tons of that rocket is the fuel kerosene and liquid nitrogen, or excuse me, liquid oxygen. It has a four-chamber main engine and four strap-on booster rockets that make up the first stage. It burns for about two minutes. The second stage is made up of one four-chamber main engine and one four-chamber steering engine, and it burns for about five minutes. 90% of that rocket is the fuel, and it takes nearly 300 tons of rocket and fuel to put a few thousand pounds of payload into orbit, lifting it just beyond the restraints of Earth's gravity. Like the payload on the top of a Soyuz rocket, God's call for genuine worship in Romans 12 is propelled by massive amounts of fuel. That fuel is the mercy of God. God. 
at God's mercy seen in his compassion towards people in helpless, pitiable condition has been detailed for us chapter after chapter in Romans to this point. Listen, rather than receiving instant punishment, the Gentiles described as sinners in chapter 1 received mercy. And rather than receiving instant punishment for being cut off for unbelief, Jewish believers can be grafted in when they believe, and some have as a remnant, and the nation will in the future as an entire repentant nation. God has been merciful to those who do not deserve mercy. He has poured out undeserved favor and kindness and grace to those who by nature and by activity have rebelled against him. The plight of humanity was one of a downward spiral of sin and being given over to further sin and being given over to further sin and further sin. And as we saw in Romans 5, all of humanity locked up in the solidarity with Adam. All of us together at the bottom of a deep pit we could not extricate ourselves from. All of us helpless, hopeless, dead. And God in his kindness looked at our miserable, pitiable condition. And rather than giving us what we deserve, offers us life in the gospel. This is the gospel that Paul preached to Jews and to Gentiles. It was the gospel he was not ashamed of. It is the gospel that provides the righteousness of God that sinners desperately need. And when we come to chapter 12 and we reflect back on 11 chapters of the description of God's mercy, we recognize that it is an immeasurable source of propellant, lifting us out of the constraints of some menial, external, irrational, so-called worship, out of the atmosphere into what Jesus said God was seeking, worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. And listen, our worship here, our presenting our bodies as living sacrifices back to God in view of his mercy is not some sort of repayment. You heard Jake detail that for us this morning in Matthew 18 in our communion meditation. Ours was a debt that could never be repaid. Your life given to God in totality of worship is not a payback. And while it's true that we are infinite debtors to his mercy... Our response of worship to him is not motivated by the thought that I can pay him back. As if once we're even, once we're square, we'll shake hands as equals and go our separate ways. That could never be the case. We will forever be indebted to God for his infinite grace on our behalf. And our indebtedness to him for us who are recipients of his mercy is not an aggravated one. It is not a grievous one. It is not a begrudging indebtedness. It is one of gratitude and love. And how could I ever thank God for all that he's done for me? Our little life presented in its totality to God as worship is fueled by the immeasurable mercy of God toward us in the gospel. Our worship, in fact, is produced by God's mercy toward us. God gave us grace. We give him worship you have to recognize that our worship is the fruit of the reign of grace. Remember, we just read it. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, I want you to give God something he doesn't have. We only give God that which pleases him, which is that which he produces in us. And we do so with gratitude and humility and joy. What does this look like? I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a sacrifice. When we think about this for a moment, a sacrifice, we often think about, oh, I'm making sacrifices. I'm making sacrifices to put my kids through college. I'm making sacrifices to uh, purchase this item I want. I I give up something in order to get something else. Uh, There are people out of a, a religious observance that give up things for Lent. I'm going to give up chocolate for Lent. I'm going to give up cherry Coke for Lent. I gave up Lent for Lent. (laughs) The idea in in that kind of a deal-making with God is, God, I want to show how much I love you by giving up something I love, 
But in effect, what you're saying is, I'm giving you something on my terms so that I can go on living my life the way I want. And, and hopefully this appeases you, God. There may be better motivations than that for giving up something for Lent. I couldn't think of any. And it, and it resembles something like pagan idolatry that, that, that says, if I worship this deity on this deity's terms, then that deity gives me what I want. Or if I appease this pantheon of deities, then I get to go on living my life my way. I just need to do this appeasement, and then I go my way. That is not the kind of sacrifice we're talking about here, where, where we give something to God, and then God will give me the green light to live my life on my terms. Now, what's in view here is you are the sacrifice. Do you see that? I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a sacrifice. You, in effect, are the priest presenting the sacrifice, and you are the sacrifice. God does not want what we could give. God demands the whole giver. And of course, when we read this, when a first century Jew read this, he would think of the Old Testament animal sacrifices. These are what would come to mind. And, and, and the animal was brought live before the priest and the altar, and the throat was slit, and the animal was offered up dead. We're not, a, we're not accustomed to animal sacrifice. We're not accustomed to having in our home, for instance, a, a, a sheep named Fluffy that our kids fall in love with and then slitting its throat and, and telling our family, this is what should happen to us, but God is merciful to put in our place an innocent substitute. We think about that in terms of uh, flannel graph children's illustrations and, and story time. It, it, it's hard for us in the 21st century, separated from animal sacrifice, to, to get a vivid picture of what this means. A death of the animal presented to God as sacrifice. And what a, what a shock that what God provided in his grace to point to the realities of his holiness and man's sinfulness, and yet God's kindness to man to provide a substitute in the place of sin so that we can live through an awful sacrifice. How these prescribed sacrifices were misused, abused, and eventually disused. And then to contemplate what it meant for Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, to be sacrificed in our place once and for all. Doing away with the Mosaic Law Old Testament sacrifices. But what's in view here, bringing all of those things to mind, is not a dead animal whose carcass is lifted up onto the altar for sacrifice but the whole walking, living, breathing carcass of your life presented before God as a sacrifice. This is a living sacrifice. And, and notice Paul says, I urge you, brothers, to present your bodies. I think there are several reasons why, why Paul says present your bodies. He wants to make sure that we don't have some sort of a Greek philosophical dualism that separates body and spirit as if body is evil, physicality is evil, spirit's good. By the way, that is so unbiblical. <laughs> you sin outwardly because of what's going on inwardly. Out of the mouth comes the things in the heart. The heart is what forms all the idolatries and adulteries and thefts and murders and everything else. Uh, we are wicked from the inside out. The immaterial man is wicked, and the body's the vehicle for that wickedness to come out. The Greek idea that the, oh, no, your spirit's really good. It's just the outward physicality that does bad stuff. Produced one of two responses for them. Either, therefore, harm the body, hurt the body, defile the body, neglect the body, um, don't do anything with the body, starve yourself, be a hermit, do all these harmful things so that your spirit can be uh, purified and benefit from its true spirituality. That was one response. Uh, the other response was, hey, so your body's evil. It will always be evil. Your spirit's good, so do whatever you want with your body. And neither one of those is appropriate 
both of those miss the point that God has de- designed humanity, immaterial and material humanity. And, and man is complete when those two are joined together. Death is a separation of those. But the body is a vehicle by which the inner man lives life out. So per- to present your bodies as a living sacrifice means worship of God is not merely internal Thoughtful, oh yeah, my relationship with God, that's private, that's between him and me. No, it's not private, it's very public. And it's very physical, it involves not only your mind, Paul's going to get to the mind in verse 2. It's not body only, it's the inner man, outer man together on the altar of sacrifice to God. But it's your hands and your feet and your lips. It is tangible, evident, visible like the tangible, evident, visible worship that was the sacrificial system before. You are the sacrifice. And listen, an animal did not know what it would be used for, right? Uh, If you're a cow, uh, am I a hamburger or a handbag or are we going to the rodeo, right? You just didn't know. The animals were unintelligent, involuntary sacrifices, but the Christian life is a living sacrifice, intelligent, voluntary, willing. And the fact that we are to present our bodies stresses the ongoing nature of this biblical worship. Consider for a moment the realities of life and death in the gospel. Right, Ephesians 2 said we were dead in our transgressions and sins, and God made us alive. You were born dead. You needed to be born again in order to be alive unto God spiritually. In Romans 5.21, we read it earlier, we were under the tyranny of death, just as sin reigned in death. Sin was our king in this realm of death, leading to death, producing death, characterized by death. We were the walking dead. In Romans chapter 6, Verses 2 and 3, do you not know that all of us who have been immersed into Christ have been immersed into his death? When you became a Christian, your spiritual dead you was crucified with Christ that brought about the death of the old you, and you were raised to new life with him, and now you walk in newness of life. Listen, only a spiritually alive person can offer the kind of worship to God that God demands. Before Christ, you were walking around, but you were spiritually dead. To abuse a quote by John Wayne, you may be walking around, but you're dead as a beaver hat. There was a life that you lived, but it was a deadness of life. After Christ, you are spiritually alive, walking in newness of life. But that life is characterized by a death to self, a putting to death the deeds of the body, of being crucified to the world, of being crucified with Christ, alive to God, and in present possession of eternal life. Jesus said, if you believe in the Son, you have eternal life, present tense. Eternal life for the Christian doesn't start when you get hit by a bus. It started when you got saved. And it continues right through the separation of your outer and inner man in your physical mortality. Death to self and life to God are the terms of the Christian life now. And they were the terms at the beginning of the Christian life, when we came to salvation. They described the manner in which we came to Christ. They described the manner in which we live for Christ. Remember what Jesus said, if any man would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Right? That's not an invitation to wear jewelry as a mark of loyalty. That is an invitation to death to self. And and notice how this sacrifice is described. Uh, Really, three adjectives describe, present your bodies as sacrifices. Living, holy, pleasing to God. Uh, Those are three parallel descriptions of your bodies offered as sacrifice. They're living. (laughs) They're living. Again, we're not offering a, a dead animal. You are offering you and all that you are, your entire life as sacrifice to God. And the sacrifice is to be holy, uh, holy positionally and practically. That is, you are set apart unto God. That is your new identity. That is your new position. But there is also an ethical holiness involved in this. Your behavior is set unto God. Your thoughts are to be set unto God. Your affections, your desires are to be set unto God. What does it mean to live out worship as a Christian? It means that 
all of me is set apart unto him. These sacrifices are living and holy, and thirdly, they are pleasing to God pleasing to God. And really, that is the bottom line on our dealings with God is what would please him? Do you ask that question regularly in life, in decision-making, in attitudes, in responses? What would please my Savior? And listen, God is always allowed to prescribe how worship is to be done. He's God. He is the creator. We are the creatures. He is independent totally holy, set apart, unique. We are dependent creatures. From him, through him, and to him are all things. He gets to decide how he is to be worshiped. And it is only right that we worship him in this way, that our desire would be pleasing to him. I remember the summer of my 17th year. I remember it distinctly because a regular task in North Texas was to mow the lawn. And mowing the lawn in North Texas meant cutting uh, the tops of the blades of grass off, and right underneath those blades of grass was a fire ant mound, and as soon as you went over it with the lawnmower, it sprayed fire ants all over your legs, and then you got bit up. I was fond of taking shortcuts to that process. My dad had a way he wanted the lawn cut, and I knew better. (laughs) My dad was not pleased when he had given me the instruction to make sure you rake up the grass clippings. I thought, you know what? I've heard of a mulching lawnmower where they take the grass clippings and let them just settle back down in. I'll just use our lawnmower like that and and I'll get the rake out and I'll rake the grass not up and out of the lawn, but into the lawn. I had set up my own terms for how I would go about my dad's business he was not pleased. (laughs) My desire to assert my own terms and to know better than he produced a significant rift in my relationship with my dad that summer, which I regret to this day. (laughs) Are you asking the question, God, how can I please you? In light of your mercy to me, (laughs) In light of the fact that all of the universe is rushing headlong to your glory and you've let me be a part of that in a good way, how can I please you? How can I please you in this next decision? How can I please you in this response to a difficulty? How can I please you in this relationship? This is what our sacrifice to God should be like. This is the heartbeat of a Christian. And Paul says, this is your reasonable service of worship. All of this, in view of God's mercy, offering your bodies a living sacrifice to him, living, holy, pleasing to him, all of that package is what it means to worship him. And it is reasonable or rational or logical. English translations are divided on the word that's used here. Probably most of you are looking at an English version that says this is your spiritual service of worship. Um, And by spiritual, the translators don't mean something like mystical, mysterious, hidden, secret, something like that. The the idea behind spiritual in the English translations is is the notion that it's not mechanical. In other words, I'm not just going through the motions. I don't come to church because I have to stand up, sit down when everybody else does, mouth the words to the songs, and then sit through that really long, boring sermon. And then, wow, I've done my thing for God. Now I go live my life. That is a mechanistic view of worship that is not worship at all. And so the idea of translating this word spiritual is to, is the idea is to capture the, the spiritual nature of it. That is the, the real internal rational nature of this is from you, from the inner man, from your spirit, from the heart. It's real, it's genuine, it's true. Some of the older English versions translated this reasonable or rational. And the Greek word here is logical. That's where we get our word logical. (laughs) That is, it, it is only appropriate that we should worship God inside and out with the totality of who we are on the basis of what he has done for us in the gospel. There is no other reasonable way to respond to the mercy of God in Christ. God, all that you've done for me. You know what? I'll give you some tokens. 
and I'll go about my business. It is not reasonable, it's not rational, and it's not true worship. What is right, appropriate before God is this idea of the totality of my being inside and out dragged up before the altar of God in living sacrifice to him. It means worshiping God on Tuesday afternoon, building widgets. And by the way, to, to think of true worship as my whole life before God does not mean, oh, you know, I worship God with my life, Romans 12, 1, and so I don't have to go to church. <laughs> um, it, would your life be a sacrifice pleasing to him if you said, oh, yeah, yeah, I worship God on my own terms, and then uh, reject everything God's about to say from Romans 12 on and how we relate to one another in the body of Christ. Of course not. Uh, to, to say, uh, my worship service isn't at church at 9 a.m. is not to say that my life worshiping before God doesn't belong at church at 9 a.m. It means that when you leave here, having gathered together corporately to worship God in song and the hearing of his word and service to one another and the, all the one another commands... When we leave here, worship doesn't end, but it continues throughout the week. And all of this fueled by God's mercy. By the way, it's really important to remember that you cannot be spiritual apart from the use of your brain, your mind, your reason, your intellect. And we'll see this further in verse 2, that, that the way, the means by which we offer our bodies as living sacrifice, uh, in significant measure, is not being conformed to the world and being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Uh, the, the use of the mind in our bodies being living sacrifices is absolutely critical. You remember at the end of chapter 11, Paul bursts forth in doxological song. It is emotional, it is theological, but worship does not end at the emotional and theological. Worship must also be bodily, physical, practical. And a worship which stops at Romans 11, at a theological and emotional high, is not worship. Theological contemplation and emotional response are movements towards worship. But where the rubber meets the road in your worship of God is what you do after you've been enamored by God's grace, after you've been emotionally enraptured by uh, reflecting on those things, perhaps with others. Daily life. Theological contemplation and emotional responses are movements towards worship. We have to be very careful about assuming that I'm worshiping God because I've engaged in an emotional experience. Man, that was great worship. I don't know. It, was it? How well are you loving your wife? How, how well are you serving the Lord when no one's looking at work? Is it truly great worship? A true worship that pleases God, while involving the emotions and grounded in the truth, always results in tangibly obedient living. You cannot separate Tuesday afternoon from Sunday morning. You cannot separate Romans 12, 1 from Romans 1 to 11. God-authored, Holy Spirit-empowered, mercy-fueled worship induces a rational, intentional, tangible, visible, outward life of dedication to God. It is deliberate, intelligent service of God with your mind, your lips, your feet, your hands, your whole life. And consider your own life this morning. Are you a recipient of God's sovereign mercy in the gospel? Do you contemplate the mercy of God in your life? Do you have a regular habit of rehearsing Romans 1 to 11 and the truths contained therein? Are you just amazed that God would be kind to you? It is a right response, an appropriate response the only reasonable response to consider your entire life a sacrifice presented to God. And it's hardly right to think that such a life devoted to God is a sacrifice in the sense of, well, I have to give up something precious. Ho-hum. Right? If you lose your life in this world, you gain everything. 
What did Jim Elliott said? He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. David Livingstone said this, it is emphatically no sacrifice to live my life for the glory of God. Say rather it is a privilege. I never made a sacrifice. Of this we ought not talk when we remember the great sacrifice which he made who left his father's throne on high to give himself for us. That's the truth. When you and I surrender ourselves on the basis of the mercy of God and infinite grace dispensed for those who don't deserve it. And we bring ourselves before God and present ourselves to him as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to him. You will never feel like you missed out, like you have lost something, like you had to trade in something so precious to get this thing you had to do called duty. The privileges and the obligations of grace are beautiful, life-transforming, and not regrettable. How kind is our God? Let's pray. We ask in these moments, oh God, that we would worship you in spirit and truth. We can't worship you aright. Even as recipients of your grace, we still feel the residual depravity in our lives, in our thoughts, in our motives. It causes us to long for the day when you will set us free totally, not only from the penalty of sin and its power of enslavement, but also one day from the presence of sin. In the meantime, O oh God, cause us to be those who revel in your mercy as a regular course of habit, and let that mercy be the fuel, the propellant for a life lived for your glory, a life lived unto you, where we present ourselves not to that old slave master sin, that our members would be weapons for destruction, but that we would present ourselves daily before you, your servants, your children, loved recipients of your mercy, eager to please you. We ask, even as we sing the words that we'll sing now, uh, that they would resonate into this week in our very lives. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.